I'm so happy to see so many people of you. Although this scares me a bit because the topic is testing untestable code. That means there's so much bad code out there. Otherwise, you would not be interested in this topic. Well, we'll see. Um, before we start, just a few words about myself. So my name is Stefan Uchtdorfer. As you can judge from my last name, I'm from Germany. I live there. I work there. Um, I'm running my own company. The company is called BitExpert. Um, we recently merged the company structure in a privately held stock company. From that day on, I was ste uh, I stepped back as being one of the CEOs and turned my full attention of managing our research labs department. That basically means that I can uh, toy with all new cool technology all day long, and I'm even getting paid for that, which is really cool. Um, I'm a long-time PHP developer, started using PHP in 1999. Um, do a little bit of Java, but um, my heart's with, with PHP. If you have any question concerning this talk, I'll be here this day and tomorrow. Um, you can write me an email. You can uh, pitch me on Twitter. Um, so many ways of, of getting in contact with me. Um, just to get a better feeling of you, just who of you have ever written a unit test, tried to test the code? Oh, quite a few. Awesome. Um, who of you have tried testing legacy application, legacy code? Okay. Who of you um, failed testing these legacy applications? Okay. <laughs> so maybe I can show you some stuff that will really help you. Um, before I show you the, the real cool fancy things, um, I have one important <coughs> remark to make. Um, when I came up with this idea for this talk, um, I was not really sure how well it get accepted in the PHP world. Because what I'm teaching you, what I'm showing you right now is really ugly hacks and ugly solutions. And I know some PHP quality guys really bitch me on that because you should not see that. So um, the important thing I want to, to share with you, this talk is no excuse for you to write bad code. If you ever try to write a new application, use all the new cool language features, use object-oriented design and stuff like that. Don't go on Monday to your coworkers and tell them that I told you that you can write bad code. This is not the intention of this talk. Um, instead, I want to help you. I want to, to give you some tips and guidelines to not freak out when dealing with such, such bad code and, and legacy applications. Um, and actually, I have to make a second remark because this, co this talk is not about testing at all. So if you really care about testing, please leave. This talk is all about creativity. Um, I show you some really freaky and fancy solutions to be able to test um, legacy applications. Um, when I thought about that, it's, it's all about creativity. I did not really um, see that when I put the first version of this talk online, but as more as I think about it, it's really all about creativity. No one of our outside of our industry knows or respects us or thinks that we are creative people. I mean, we have so many um, languages to choose from. We have so many technologies we can pick from, like the NoSQL stuff or um, data stores of any kind. And it's all about our creativity to get all this, this stuff together and uh, build something really cool. Um, what's really funny, what, what I think is really funny, that it's really easy to write tests, unit tests, but it's really hard to write testable code. I mean, writing a unit test is really simple. Um, you create your object that you want to test, you create the dependencies, you put them together, you call the method you want to, t you want to test, um, you check if the returning value is the one that you expected, and that's it. It can be 20 lines or so. But writing really testable code, testable applications, is really hard, and this is not really um, the scope of this talk. So what is untestable code? Have you any idea what qualifies as untestable code? No one has an idea? Oh. Right. Um, when I asked this question once, someone from the audience um, uh, raised his hand and said, my coworker's code. This is probably not the, the explanation I, I wanted to hear. Um, so other people said um, private methods, final methods, really long methods. Um, that's all true, but there's more. When I did the research for this talk, I could identify three main indicators um, where you can judge if your code is testable or not. Um, 
Number one is wrong object construction. You're just using the new keyword everywhere. Um, so you have your class, your class A, and somewhere in the, inside the method you have a new class B. What this affects is that um, you have directly bound class A to class B. You can't exchange uh, class B during your testing. Um, you can work around with that in, in uh, new applications when you're using dependency injection approaches, like David has mentioned before. Um, tight couplings is, is, a, is another indicator of, of untestable code, because with tight coupling, you bind or you bound a concrete implementation to one certain class. You can't exchange it on runtime. This also um, counts for static method calls, where you just in, write in your code the class name, uh, colon, colon, and the, co the method you call. You can't exchange that when you're testing your application, and thus you cannot um, really make sure that um, you can control what's, what's, get, what's get getting back to, to your uh, class. So you can't really do code reuse. Code reuse is really hard when you have this tightly coupled code. What you actually want is um, isolatable classes, classes that stand on their own. You can test them um, this way much better than instead of having this big object graph um, where you can't be really sure what's going on inside. Um, number three, the third indicator is something I call uncertainty. With uncertainty, I basically mean global state, global variables, um, the same as singletons or registry pattern, um, stuff like that. Global variables are really cool, but it's really hard to know which part of your application sets the global variable to which state. And if you really cannot be sure when which state was set, it's, un, it's, it's important or impossible, sorry, impossible for you um, to write a unit test because you have no clue um, when which value was set. I once talked with a developer and said, we got, we got rid of all these global variables. We're using a registry instead. Well, that's not really good. I mean, a registry is ex exactly the same as global variables, but instead of having a couple of them, you're just going to have one global object, the registry, and you're just going to access um, these items. Um, the really bad thing about this is that you can't predict the outcome because you have no clue um, which, uh, which state the, the global variables are. And um, this is really important. We need to have control. We need to have control over the environment, of our testing environment. We need to have the control about our, de our dependencies, else um, we cannot write really good tests. Uh, I show you this in a, in a better example. So in a perfect world, you would have your unit tests on the left, you would have the system under test, or the class you want to test on the right. The unit test directly interacts with the system under test, and everything's working fine. You call your methods um, and uh, compare the returning values. Unfortunately, we're dealing with legacy code, and legacy code is far away from being perfect. So in this case, we have the system under test, the class we want to test, um, and its dependencies. What we do in this case is we do not test our class we, what we do is we test our class and the communication with its dependencies. Now you could say in this example, okay, we're dealing with three classes that it's, it's okay, we, we can deal around with that, we can, can uh, see the code and we can understand how this works. This is true in this case, it, it can really get bad um, if the dependencies have dependencies as well. Because um, in this case, you end up with this huge object graph, you have no clue when which method is really called and what happens with the returning values. It gets even worse if one of the dependencies um, is talking to a database and you have your database access credentials hard-coded in the PHP code. I've seen this a couple of times. Um, this would mean that any time I would run a test case, like um, imagine we have this e-commerce application, we want to test the order management. Any time I create an order um, for the test case, it would just directly be pushed in our production database. It's no good idea. Um, the same counts for uh, mail servers. Um, like we could send out emails there. You could have your access credentials there as well. And um, you would fire up the test and it would send out emails to, to masses. Or let's think about web services. Um, you could have this e-commerce application that it's um, doing some e-payment stuff. Um, so you would, on the one hand, have to provide your access credentials to the, to the unit test, which is probably not so good. I don't would 
provide my own access credentials, my own credit card data publicly to my developers just that the test case can run. On the other hand, this would mean that any time the test case is run, a credit card transaction is being done, which costs money. Um, so this is not good. What do we want to achieve? Well, we try, well, we want to cut off the dependencies so we can really, again, focus on the system under test. Um, how do we get that? How can we change bad code into testable code? Any one of you an idea? Pardon? Mockups. Mock yeah, pro yeah, that's one of the outcomes. Um, we actually convert the code. What, what, means, what I mean with convert is actually we do refactoring. Um, so refactoring actually is the process of changing the source code without modifying its external behavior. So you change internal, do some, some changes internally, but externally um, it does not feel like there's a difference. So we use that to improve all the non-functional attributes of our software. Um, we're reducing the complexity, um, improving the maintainability, improving the quality of the code, and things like that. If you think of refactoring, um, there is a guy who wrote a fabulous book about that. His name is called Martin Fowler. If you don't have the book, buy it, it's awesome. Um, when I compiled the slides and I came to that one, um, I just grabbed his book, I just skimmed through the first 20 or 40 pages just to refresh my memories, and I stumbled across one sentence that really hit me. In his book, Martin Fowler states, before you start refactoring, check you have a solid suite of tests. Now this is the chicken egg problem. I don't have tests because my uh, legacy application is so badly written and I can't really refactor it because I should have tests according to Martin. So I'm really in a refactoring dilemma. Um, what can we do? Just do nothing and hope. Now hope is not a good idea in IT. Um, you should never ever hope. I, I know, I hope this works. How many developers have said that? <laughs> right, <laughs> one, <laughs> awesome. Um, true example, I was, I was giving this talk um, at a software developer conference in Nashville in the USA um, in March this year. So I knew I would have to take a, a power converter with me to, to plug in all my electronic devices in the US. Um, so I just flew there, um, I was working on my laptop during the flight um, when I was in the hotel, I tried to connect my, my laptop using the power plug to the, to the uh, power, power provider in, in the US, and I could not fit it in. This, this power convertible worked for each and every device I had, except for, for my notebook. So um, yeah, I did not test it, I just hoped it would work, and I was really fucked up, um, sort of. Okay, what can we do? What can we do? Um, we could do nothing. We could just gonna leave it as it is, but I guess you're not here uh, to hear that. Um, probably. A nice idea would be, let's build the software from the scratch again. I mean, we're developers. We like starting from the scratch again, right? Whoever wants to write the software from scratch again? Awesome. Yes, yeah, super. Um, but there's a problem. You see, I told you this is legacy code. This is, means it's this code that it's there for five or 10 years, meaning that um, it has changed a bit or a bit more, depending on, on the business needs. Um, maybe the developers who started the project are, not long, are no longer within the company. Maybe the product owner is no longer in the company. Um, since it's legacy application, it's probably not that well documented. Um, so actually you really don't have any clue what's going on in there. So using this in mind, it's probably not the best way to start it from scratch again. Um, what could you else do? Well, you could refactor it without unit tests. This may or may not work um, depending on the portions of your code uh, uh, you process at one time. If you're really using small chunks, it, pro it would probably work. Um, what else can you do? You could use UI testing. Um, I guess most of you would write web applications, right? So you have a user interface in your web browser. Um, you could use tools like Selenium, Windmill, Waiter. There are tons of tools, JavaScript-based tools that allow you to 
click through the, the user interface and just see what's on the page, so you could do that. Um, this may or may not work for every single part of your application. If I um, think of the, the stuff that we have done, not every state of each of the objects would be visible in the user interface. Um, if that happens to you, you could add several other pages that are just deployed on your testing system, which would just render um, the state of the object, so you could, could grab those informations and check if these are valid or not. Um, or we could try adding tests um, and refactor afterwards, and this is just the stuff I want to show you. What I really love about PHP is that it's a really dynamic language. We can do really fancy and cool, ugly, whatever you call it, stuff. Um, you could, we could do way more things than, than the guys from the static or compiled languages. I tried a couple of things I, I show you with Java and it's not doable. Um, so we are really blessed with this wonderful dynamic language. Um, Okay, before I show you the samples, there's one really important point um, that I had in my mind when I've try, well, I was trying figuring out what I can, could do. Um, I don't want to change the existing source code. This is really important. Do you have any idea why? Well, it's easy, because when I change the code, I could introduce new bugs, and I don't obviously want that. Um, so I just want to make the software testable, but I don't want to, to add new, new bugs. Um, I will show you examples from three different parts. I will show you how to cope with object construction, how to create objects, um, how to deal with external resources, and um, a category I call language issues, which just shows some weird and crazy shitty stuff. Um, object construction, take this example. Um, we have a class car. The class car has a private member called engine. In the constructor, um, the constructor has a parameter. It's a string. It would be fine. The engine object that would be created. We take that string, we pass it to, uh, to a factory method engine get by type. The returning value is assigned to the uh, member variable. Now this is perfectly a, a wonderful example for absolutely stupid code. Because what you do in this case is, um, you indirectly manage or push a dependency into the class. Um, you do it indirectly because you define a string that then gets mapped in the factory to an object. Instead, you could have passed the object directly to, to your class and everything would be fine. In this case, we have bound the class car to the class engine. That means any time I want to reuse my car, I have to reuse the engine class as well, um, which is not good. Uh, as you can judge from the example, there is no include or uh, require statement on top. So this is the, the better code, I guess. Um, in this case, it's pretty obvious that, that the PHP application is using the auto load mechanism of, of PHP 5. Um, so what we can do is um, um, make use of that. So what we do is we, we write a custom auto loader function. Um, in this auto loader function, we're just going to check which class should be loaded. In this case, we check if the class is uh, of type engine. In that case, we just um, redirect the load to a completely different directory. That means we copied this engine uh, factory, um, made it a mock, um, put it somewhere else on the disk, and any time um, the engine class is, is getting referred to, um, it will load our custom implementation in the testing environment. Since we have written this, uh, this engine factory, we know exactly how it behaves internally, and thus we can react on it in the unit tests. Any questions so far? Awesome. Um, this is quite similar idea. So in this case, we have the include statement on top, um, meaning that we can't do the, the auto-loading uh, uh, version. Um, but what you can do in this case is just going to manipulate our include path. So um, before the test starts, we just set the include path. The first path would be, uh, again, the, the path to our custom mock implementations. Um, and as you probably all know, um, PHP is, uh, is using the include path and just going to looking in each and every segment and trying or, or just um, using the first 
version that really matches. So if it finds the engine.php file in our custom mox directory, it was just going to quit and uh, not checking the other parts, uh, parts as well. So in this case, we can um, preload, I would call it, um, our custom implementation, and it would just use it the same way as before. Now I want to show you my really favorite example. And if you don't take anything from this talk, this really rocks. I love this one. Um, who of you is aware of, of the stream wrappers of PHP? Just one, two? Okay, just a few. Okay, so stream wrappers are a way that um, you can define your own protocols um, and implement functions to uh, read and write and, and do stuff like that. Um, the funny thing is that the, the file uh, protocol in PHP is also a stream wrapper, so the default implementation. What we do in this case is just going to replace it with a custom version that we, that we have written. Um, in the stream open method, which would, as the method is called, open the stream, um, we get a path passed as the first parameter. What we're just going to do is um, we change that. The same way we did it before, we're going to check if that if, if the path contains the engine.php file, we would then, again, redirect it to a completely different directory. And um, this is completely transparent from the PHP process. Um, so the PHP interpreter does not really know where the file is coming from, where the content is coming from. Um, it would just read it and um, behave normally. So all you have to do is unregister the default file stream wrapper and register your custom class. And this is completely transparent. <coughs> you can do other cool things with stream wrappers. Um, there is a stream read method, which is, a, is responsible for reading the contents from, from the file. What we can do in this case is we're just going to read the content. And we do a string replacement. So we search for engine get by type and replace it with abstract engine get, which is our custom implementation. Again, this is completely transparent. So the PHP interpreter has no clue what's in the file. It just got the modified content and will work with it. Um, though this is really, this is really a, a way of uh, manipulating the file and um, making sure that it will, it will work. Um, namespaces. The stuff I showed you with the auto-loading and the include path will also work with namespaces, so you, should, you don't care, um, although Legacy applications tend to not have uh, namespaces, obviously, because they are five to ten years old. Um, that's it. External resources. What I mean with that? Well, it's databases, web services, uh, file systems, or mail servers. Um, you have to deal with mocking a database. How could you do that? Well, on the one hand, you could provide your own implementation, depending on the framework that you're using. Um, I just tried it for Zen Framework and it was quite easy. Um, I had to do two steps. I had to, to implement the ZendDB statement interface and create a custom class. And I needed to subclass the ZendDB adapter abstract uh, class and just going to hook things up. And just by using these two lines of code, I could set up my own custom database adapter and um, return the objects um, in such as um, the database pretended to be. So it would not directly hit the database. It was, would just hit uh, my custom class and just going to return the stuff. <coughs> if you're using PHP unit, um, PHP unit has an extension that's called database test case, um, which can help you as well. Um, so it's just a, a class that you extend from. And um, any time that a test case is run, um, beforehand it would uh, run a certain method that would push data inside the database. And afterwards, after your test case is run, it would clean up the stuff. Um, before you experiment with that, make sure that you're not coding against the production database, because that is not a good idea. Um, what else can you do? Well, probably there is a way that to have a proxy for your SQL server. If you're using MySQL, there's MySQL proxy, which you can just um, put in the middle between your application and the, the database. Um, this is a scriptable tool. Um, and you probably can uh, redirect the calls to the different uh, databases um, depending on um, your, your application. So if you're running the application from your testing environment, you pr could probably um, detect that and just going to redirect it 
to another database. <clears throat> so, mocking web services, more or less similar. Um, you could provide your own implementation. I mean, web services are really cool because web services define a contract, right? Um, they tell you exactly what parameters they do accept, and they tell you exactly um, how the returning values would look like. So it's quite easy for you to provide your own implementation that's just gonna dust the stuff exactly as you want for the test case. Um, there's just gonna one problem. In most cases, you would have hard-coded the web service URL somewhere in the application code, so you can't really easily exchange that. Well, sort of. Um, what you could do is um, to add an entry to your ETC host file, which just would say um, if you want to access this access uh, webservice.log or uh, dot, .org or whatever, just gonna redirect it back to my own IP address. If you have the, uh, if you have the web service URL encoded as, as an IP address, um, you probably have to, to create a new, web, uh, new um, network interface on your local system and just gonna try to pretend um, that IP address. So you could just gonna manipulate that as well and just um, make the calls going locally to your own server may or may not work. Um, mocking file system. And this is again really, really a cool thing because I don't know of any other language that allows you to do that. Um, at some point in your application, you probably have to write a file on disk. This is awesome on, on, a, on a production server, but can really bit you on, on a testing environment. Um, because you have to make sure that the, the file's getting erased um, after the test case and, and things like that, and you have enough space to, to write to the, to the file system. Um, what you can do in this case is uh, you can set up a virtual um, file system, so a file system in the memory, and um, there is an extension that is called, or a library that is called um, VFS Stream. Have you heard of that? No, that's awesome. Um, yeah, what it does, it creates a virtual directory inside your memory. Um, you can pass the URLs to your application, and instead of um, hitting the real uh, file system on disk, it would create all the directories and all the files in memory. And the uh, library keeps track of that, and you can check, like in this case, um, if we have really created the uh, sample directory. So it don't touch the disk, it's all inside the memory. Um, they use exactly the same stream wrapper functionality like I showed you before. So this is really cool. Um, mocking mail service. Now this is not that easy. Um, what you could use is um, a Linux tool that is called fake mail, which could, uh, could set up a, a, a fake mail server, which um, would um, log every mail that it's being sent to on disk so you can uh, check that everything's right and no mails are sending out. If you're using Windows, there's a tool called a test mail server tool, which does exactly the same. Um, if you find these solutions too fancy, um, this is a really nice one. Um, just gonna found on the net. It's by a guy called uh, Chris Schifflet. Um, in your php.ini file, there is the send mail path that you can define. Um, you can create a custom custom send mail binary or a send mail bash script and uh, inside that just gonna log everything that's coming in into a log file. So this is really the, the easiest solution. <clears throat> um, yeah, as I said, dealing with language issues is just some, again, crazy wacky stuff that might, can help you. Anytime I give this talk, at least one member of the audience um, asks me how he could test private methods. Um, now we never ever should test private methods because as the name implies, they are private. Um, if you really want to do that, there are a couple of ways, sorry, there are a couple of ways you can do that. Again, you could use our custom stream wrapper that I showed you before, and we simply replace every occurrence of private function with public function. This is really ugly. <laughs> I like that. So um, you easily turned all your, all your methods public and you could call them from, from anywhere. Um, on the other hand, you could use a reflection API from PHP. So uh, you could create the class, uh, create the method. You set the method to accessible 
and then it just can invoke it like, like any other method and just gonna grab the returning value and thus can um, test the actual method. If you don't want to do that, um, there is another way what, what we can do. Um, in some places, like the, the mail function, it's probably not so easy to set up this, this mail server stuff like that. Um, it would be really cool if you could overwrite or unload the, um, the mail function, which is built in a PHP. Um, unloading doesn't really work. Unloading works for, for the modules like MySQL or, or Postgres. Um, unfortunately, mail is part of the, in, the PHP core, so you can't unload that. Um, so you have no way of overriding it well up to now. Um, there's this really cool extension that's called RunKit. You can easily install it on a Linux using this command. And RunKit allows you to override um, predefined functions. How does that look like? Um, you have to enable it using the INI set parameter. And in this case, we just redefine the mail function the ins uh, of PHP, and we just say, um, any time the mail function is called, we execute return true, which is the default behavior of, of the mail function. So your code will not break, no mail will get sent out, and everything's working. Yes? Can I use a call like a message for a um, I don't think so, um, but I have something else for you. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a bit limited, so um, it may or may not work. Um, for you, we use FunCall. FunCall is awesome. Um, who of you is aware of um, aspect-oriented programming, AOP? Oh, okay, just a couple, nice. Um, so FunCall is a bit of AOP for PHP. Um, again, really easy to install on, on Linux. Just use the peckle install command. Um, after the extension is loaded, um, we have an fc underscore add underscore post and an fc add underscore pre function that we can call. Um, we define there first the, the name of the function that um, should be overloaded. Like in this case, it's the my func function, which is called on top or defined on top. And um, this line just going to say after my func is executed, um, call the post underscore cb function afterwards, directly afterwards. Um, the post the underscore cb function gets as a first parameter all the arguments that were passed to, to my func, so I could grab them and um, just do some fancy stuff and return anything I want back to the callee. Um, I get the result delivered of the, of the my func um, function, so I could manipulate that as well. And I get the process time, which probably is not that much of interest. Um, so I just call my func, in this case PHP and C, and I could return anything I want in the postcb method. So this is really nice for um, yeah, returning custom values when you can't really um, find any other way to get inside. So these are really ugly hacks. Um, I've given this talk in Verona this, this year, and one guy of the audience said, well, you see, all the examples you showed are really nice code. Have you ever tried to test something like PHP MyAdmin, where you have this um, HTML stuff and PHP snippets inside? This is really ugly code, and I said no. But um, we can find something for that. So yeah, what else? Um, you see, we are quite limited. Although PHP, as I said, is a dynamic language, you can do a lot of stuff. Um, there's just some limitations we hit. And any time we as programmers or software developers hit a limitation, um, we tend to think about abstractions, like um, adding different layers. I'm not sure if that many are familiar with Assembler of you. Um, so in, in the past days, a couple of, of years back, people really wrote Assembler. Um, that worked out quite well for them. After a while, they thought, well, it might be not that good for, for the new applications to write all things in Assembler. We are, I, I have these functions. I want to reuse them, stuff like that. So, invent, so they invented C at this functional programming, um, which still exists today. At a certain point, someone came up with the idea of object orientation. So they invented languages like Java or C++. It's always putting a layer on top of each other. And we do exactly the same in this case. Um, 
there is a paradigm that it's called generative programming. It has completely nothing to do with testability at all, um, but can help us in this case to create custom code or, or a code that um, we can manipulate. Um, in generative programming, we are dealing with a so-called generator, a software generator. I should say that there are two types of generators. We have code generators, which are doing um, easy transformations, I would call them, like you would have an XML file that is transformed to a SQL file um, via some really easy mappings. Um, a software generator, on the other hand, is a quite complex system that will allow you, based on an abstract specification, um, to build a, completely, a complete software application for your client. Um, that could be like um, you have some kind of web form with some easy questions and uh, a client could, could just simply check um, which features they want and the software generator would then take this as input and um, create the application from scratch for the customer. I know that sounds really fancy. Um, so we have this configuration part. Um, the generator knows of the configuration. The generator has some something that we call implementation components. These are small snippets of code. This could be a class, this could be a function, this could be a single line of code, just depending on the features. The generator just gonna maps that, takes all the components um, that are involved for the current configuration, uh, throws them together in, in one pot and creates one of the products. Um, we use that behavior and just gonna say we have two products in our case. We have the application, which is the legacy application, and we have our test cases. And depending on what I want to generate, the generator would um, add or remove certain code elements and allow us to um, yeah, create a testable, um, testable application. The software generator um, uses a paradigm or a, a feature that we call a frame. A frame, this is, quite an abstract definition is a data structure for representing knowledge. This is coming from um, the uh, field of artificial intelligence. Um, a frame basically is a text file. So in this case, it could look like a PHP file you see uh, on screen, um, except for, um, okay, my pointer doesn't work, except for the uh, uh, factory part right in the middle, which, um, you could think of some kind of template variable. Like you probably know Smarty or, or the other template engines. So this is quite similar. So we just defined a slot, um, an exchangeable component, exchangeable part that then will be um, um, filled by our software generator with the, right, um, with the right meaning. Each of the frames has a frame controller. The frame controller knows of all the features and knows how to react when a certain feature is chosen or was chosen by, uh, by the configuration. So in this case, the code is pretty simple. We simply check if in the configuration file is a feature that is called unit test. We then set this factory um, variable to factory mock, else we use the engine factory, as this would be um, the legacy application that we want to generate. Um, so if we run the generator in the test case mode, it would create something like this. It would just um, exchange the, uh, the slot to the right meaning, in this case to the, to the factory mock, which again is a, a custom class that we've implemented on our own, which we know how it would um, react to, to certain parameters. <clears throat> if we say we want to, to generate the application, um, yeah, if we want to generate the application, it would um, generate the original implementation there. And thus we, um, we have, um, uh, we still apply to the rule that I said before that we do not want to change the existing code because the legacy application after the generation process looks exactly the same. We just, in testing mode, um, strip off everything we do not want or replace it with some custom implementations that we can, can work with and that's it. So what can we do with that? Um, well, as I said, we can show or hide parts of the code. 
like in the PHP uh, my admin example, um, we could strip off all the HTML stuff from the files and just deal with the pure PHP code um, and make it more testable. Or we could just um, strip off the send mail function, just gonna get rid of that. So in the test case, it would not be generated. <clears throat> we could then change the contents of global variables, just depending in which, in which state we are. So um, we again know exactly how the test case would react and thus we can, um, can compare the test results with, the, with our expectations. Um, we could define prefixes or postfixes to, to the methods. Um, thus again, allowing us to call custom implementations that we know how they're working with um, and we can deal with that. So we can completely change the source code. Um, this may or may not sense in, in, in every single way. Um, what you could do is you could completely rearrange the, the different parts of your source code, um, which could result in an application that it's not usable or not testable, or it would just simply behave completely differently in your testing environment and in, in, the, in the legacy application, which obviously is not what you want. Um, but it really can help you just to, um, to extract the portions of your code that you really want to test. Um, if you're really interested in that, we will release an open source version of that. I know your PHP developers. This is Java. You don't need to write any Java code at all. In best case, you're just gonna hack some XML st stuff together. Um, so don't be scared. Um, yeah. Is it worth it? Easy question to an easy answer, it depends. It really depends on your application. It depends on um, how important the application is to your own company. Like if it's an applica a legacy application that is running for 10 years, you fix a bug once a year or twice a year. It probably does not make that much sense to do all that stuff because this can be really hard to do to um, really make the code testable. On the other hand, if it's an application where you're regularly fixing bugs, like every month the stuff is coming in, um, it would probably be, a good, uh, probably be a good idea to do that. Um, it also depends how complex it is to write such a test. If it's really easy, you could do that. Um, yeah, basically it just depends on the business value. I mean, if, if this is an application in your, inside your, your corporation that just don't um, generate some money, it's probably unlikely to test that. If it's an application where, where you're your company is really generating a lot of money with it. It's probably a bit easier to, to convince your, uh, your bosses to, to try these approaches just to make sure the applications um, will be testable and you can assure that everything is working fine. So this is uh, the basic idea. Conclusions. Yeah, change your mindset. So when you're writing applications from the scratch, try to think how to make this testable. Try to experiment with that and make sure that you can exchange the dependencies on runtime and uh, make sure your application is becoming testable. Um, I really like PHP. I, I call PHP the Swiss Army knife, which uh, reflects somehow uh, my past because I'm half Swiss. Um, so you could do a lot with PHP. Uh, you could really do some ugly stuff as I showed you. Don't do that in production. This is just for the testing part. Um, yeah, um, that's it. Any questions? Yes. Um, so I have a question about the human part of refactoring and uh, doing the Oh, human part is dangerous. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's very hard to um, understand refactoring and understand the new testing. And it's mostly the case that you guys think about influences That's a good question. That's probably depending on, um, on the development practices of your company. Um, so you definitely should read the book by Martin Fowler because he has some really good um, explanations how you should start refactoring, um, how the different steps should be done. Um, so this could give you some valuable insight. Um, yeah, another tip would be um, just start small. 
really refactor small methods because um, if you try to refactor a big bunch of a big block, um, you will likely fail. So if you start small and just gonna work your way through, um, it might be a, a better way. Does that answer your question? To some extent. <laughs> you can ask me later on. Yeah. How do you test, how do you test uh, modules or something like this that change the a lot of uh, rows or collections of models in the database? Because it's hard to mock things like that when That's right. you have to check if the query was correct. And That's exactly right. So when the, when the queries that you're doing in, in, in the operation is quite complex, um, you probably should um, really use a real database, like setting up a separate testing database, um, if, you, if the application allows that. Um, because I, I tried that once um, to, to sneak in the code and check the queries and react on that. It can get quite tricky if you're doing really a bunch of operations and really have to think um, when you update a bunch of rows, what should happen and what needs to be happen and track all that. So in this case, it's probably a better idea just to use a database that knows its stuff and uh, uh, use that for, for this reason. Anyone else? No questions. Cool. Okay. So thanks so far. Um,